service, I'll be honest with you and tell you, they started kind of slow. And we had to kind of get them going this morning. But once we got them going, we had a great time. They praised and worship, raised their hands, clap, yell, whatever they want to. So I said to you this morning, let's just be excited. Sing to the Lord right off the bat and just have a great time this morning. Our God who reigns forever and all the world will know his name. Everyone together will sing the song of the redeemed. worship right Denny it should be fun to praise and worship and that's what we're here to do this morning the next song we're going to sing is what we've done many times but it talks about better is one day and just think about what is heaven going to be like we all have this perceived I bet if I went around this morning that everybody would have a different picture of heaven and what it's going to be like but we have to be excited about when we get there what it's really going to look like what it's going to be like who we get to talk to the things that we get to do I've seen this before. I, I can't wait to see the golf courses up there. I can't wait to see the food up there. I can't wait to see all these people that we want to see and talk to. So let's just be excited this morning and let's talk about 
what it's going to be like to be there. How lovely is your dwelling place, O oh Lord Almighty, my soul. Within your presence, I seem beneath the shadow of your wings. Let's sing about better is one day. Better is one day.
good to see everybody this morning. And if you've got your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16. And uh, we're going to go ahead and continue in this series on David. And uh, I pray that you've come ready to receive from God. You know, when we come to church, we come to, yes, see other people and socialize a little bit. But, man, we're here to hear from God's Word. And my prayer for you is that you're praying, God, change me, mold me, show me. I'm, a, I, I'm, a, I'm in a process. Just continue to help me to be more like Christ. And I pray that's your request. And, and another thing that I want to start, I'm going to start uh, mentioning more and more, um, bring your Bible with you. Um, bring your Bible with you. If you don't have a Bible, get one. and bring. I know technology today, it's so much easier to, to use, you know, just to uh, uh, look on your phone or something like that. But, but you need to have a Bible, and, and, and you can put these uh, outlines that I have, and you say, well, I didn't really get an outline. Man, we've got some awesome people out front here that are handing out worship guides, and they take the time to fold them and put them all together and, and take one. And then uh, I'm going to read a lot of Scripture today, but uh, I'll tell some stories uh, about David. But I'm going to skip a lot of stuff uh, because we just don't have time to go through all of it. And uh, so you need to go back through this, and you can take your outline and go back through and read through the Bible. And, and uh, uh, a question that was asked this morning says, what version of the Bible do you use? Because I'm I, my version, you know, I'm, I'm trying to follow you, but I'm using my version. And so I use the NIV most of the time. I like all versions. Any version of the Bible that's preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ, that's what I, I like. But I, I tend to like the, the NIV better. Uh, just for, for the preaching purposes, I use a lot of different other versions. I've got multiple ones in my office at home, and so, but that's the one that I use. But anyway, um, the main thing is, is that you have a Bible and that you're reading your Bible, and when you bring your Bible to church, and that way you can mark in it and make notes and, and stick this, little, this uh, outline in your Bible and go home and during your week this week, just kind of go through it and, and follow up and do some more study because there's a lot of good stuff in the Bible, and you need to be reading it. So anyway... We're going to talk about something today that's going to affect all of us, and I pray that we take it from the Bible's point of view. And that is, uh, I want to focus on our influence in, that we have in our life, the influence of the people that are around us and uh, how we handle that. Because I believe the, 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 perhaps the best way to measure uh, someone's maturity is how we handle power, how we handle authority, how we handle the influence that is in our life. And you say, well, I, you may say, well, I don't really have a big you know, audience. I don't really have a big platform where I have this authority thing. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. It can be in smaller realms. But we have influence in our life. When you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior and you start maturing and you start growing, you're going to have more and more influence on others in your life because they're going to see what's happening in your life and they're going to ask you questions. And the way we handle ourselves is so, so important, no matter if you're at work. No matter if you're at school, no matter if you're on a board or a meeting, having a meeting, or whether it's in the home, in your family, all of us have influence. And so I want to look at David's life today, and we're going to look at some things that's going to teach us, and I believe it'll help you today. But what happens to you at the moment when you realize that all eyes are on you? All eyes in the room, they're on you. In other words, they're looking for you. You, you realize you've got the power, you've got the influence, the attention is drawn to you for whatever reason, whatever uh, atmosphere that you're in, when that happens to you, it says a lot about you, the way you handle it in that moment, and a lot about myself, when I, how I handle it in that moment, whenever we have influence in our life. And again, the reflection of our individual maturity comes from how we handle power, authority, and uh, uh, influence in our life. And I, I think it's irritating to all of us. You see somebody that's got this kind of power. They might have a position now or a title has been given to their name, and all of a sudden they abuse it for their own selfish you know, benefits. You've seen that happen. In other words, they got the position, and now they're large and in charge, and they do everything for their benefit, and they don't really care about the people that are following. It irritates us, right? But it's also very inspiring when you see someone who has given some influence, given some authority in their life, and now they use that for the benefit of the others in the room. In other words, they deny themselves of some things. They deny themselves some things that they may really want. But they deny it because they do it for the benefit of everybody that's in the room. And that's the kind of leader that we want to be. And that's the kind of leader that we, the kind of influence that we want to be around is people that are like that. And we're going to, say this, we're going to see where this is biblical because we're going to see that this is what David does. But anyway, some of us have heard stories of some of the greatest leaders, some of the greatest influences, and we've seen how that they've denied their self. And they've done things for the benefit of everybody in the room. And they're like heroes because you just know they did what was right. In David's case, well, in our case, we don't know what we do until we're given a position a lot of times. Until you're put in that situation, you really don't. You'd say, well, if I was the leader, I, if I had that kind of influence, I'd do this. 
But you don't know until you get there. You don't know what buttons you'd push and how you would handle it until you get that kind of power and that kind of influence when everybody's looking at you and they're looking at you for the answers. Or in David's case, when you get the crown. We're going to see where David becomes king today in our fourth week in the series of David. We're going to, he's fine. I know somebody's saying, he's finally going to become king. Yeah, he's going to become king today. He's learned a lot of life lessons along the way. But today is when he's going to be crowned the king, and we're going to see this. So let's kind of build up to that. First Samuel chapter 16, but let me tell you what's kind of going on here uh, when this is going on. So really, David, he's just a young boy. He's a middle schooler, and uh, he's probably, you know, in his middle school years. But Samuel is the prophet. Now, Samuel is like the authority of the nation of Israel other than King Saul. You know, King Saul's the king, but the next probably in line, you know, right at his right hand would probably be, you know, Samuel. He's the prophet. And so Samuel goes to King Saul's house. And when he goes to King Saul's house, he, he goes, you know, King Saul's not there, but the Bible says that he goes to Jesse. Now, some of you may say, well, who's Jesse? That's David's father. And Jesse had many sons, and David, who we've been talking about, is one of them. And so he goes to Jesse, and he says, Jesse, I'm on a mission. And he didn't really tell him what kind of mission. And we're going to learn that he was really on a secret mission. And you say, well, why was he on a secret mission? Because he was really what his job was to do is the Lord was sending him to anoint the next king. And you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, when you're going to anoint the next king and the first king is still in office, <laughs> you want to keep it a secret, all right? You don't want everybody to know, all right? Because your life's going to be in danger. But anyway, he's going to anoint the, the second king. And he, he's been told that it's going to be one of Jesse's sons. So he goes into this place, and he says, Jesse, look, we're going to have this big special sacrifice. And, man, I want all your family, I mean, every one of your members of your family to come, and they're all invited. Man, just bring them all, bring them all, and uh, we're just going to have a good time. And, but he really didn't tell Jesse what he was really doing. And so the idea is, is when he gets all these boys in here and all the family, but he's looking at the sons because, you know, who's going to be the next king? And he's looking around, and the idea was is that whenever he saw the right one, God would give him the God nod. You know, just kind of, that's it. <laughs> he would just know who it was. So he invites everybody to the sacrifice, and he's looking around, he's scanning around, it's like, which one is going to be the next king? So here we go, in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 6. Let's start there. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab. Now, he was the oldest son of Jesse. And so... And uh, whenever he arrived, he thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands right here before me. So Samuel's thinking, surely this is going to be the one, you know, because in humanly speaking, the oldest one will be the next one in line, right? That's just the way the king or the leadership was. It was the, the oldest son would get the next, be the next in line. So Samuel's like, this is going to be easy, man. But then look in verse 7, the very next verse. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance. Humanly, what do we do? A lot of times we give authority and we give influence according to the way people look sometimes. That's just, you know, in society we think, all right, that looks like a person of authority or, yeah, I'll give them authority. He says, do not look at his appearance or his height. In other words, for I have rejected him. And then the Lord does not look at the things that people look at. Listen to this. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You say, well, I've heard that before. Well, now you know where it is in the Bible, right? Did you underline that in your Bible? Well, I didn't bring my Bible. Well, you need to bring your Bible, okay? <laughs> you Now you know where it is. It's in the story of David. You know, one of the times it's in here. He looks at, not at the outer appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. And so what a man is is what's in him, right? So ladies, don't let these guys fool you, all right, by their outer appearance. And what is in a lady is what makes her, right? And guys, well, never mind. Anyway, you're not going to. There's no hope for you. But anyway, <laughs> six sons later, he's looking at all these different sons, all right? He's, he's, uh, he's checking out all those sons, and nobody knows what's going on but him. And he's looking around, and they're having, you know, this little sacrifice, special sacrifice thing, and everybody's there. And he's looking around, and he's thinking, all right, which one is it? And he's looking, he says, he's not getting a God nod on any of them. And he's thinking, man, what have I missed? What is wrong? I, I don't understand why I'm not seeing. So he goes to Jesse, and he says, yo, yo, Jesse. He said, look, I invited your whole family. Is everybody here? And Jesse's like, yeah. Well, well, no, there's one that's not here. David, he's out in the, in the field. But look what it says in verse 11. Are these all the sons you have? He's asking Jesse. And Jesse says, there is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. In other words, go get that last one. And so this 12, 13-year-old boy comes in, maybe 14, comes in. And uh, he comes in the room, and as soon as Samuel sees little David, he got the God nod. I don't know how that happened. I don't know how God told him, but he knew that little middle school boy, he was the one. 
So, the Bible says in verse 12, Then the Lord said to Samuel, Rise and anoint him, this is the one. And the strange thing, according to the scriptures, as you read on through there, and again, I'm going to skip through some of this stuff, so go back and read it. But he's going to go over to David then, and he's going to take some oil, and the Bible says he's going to pour the oil over his head. <laughs> and then he's going to pack his stuff up, and Samuel's leaving. And the whole family's like, what just happened here? You know, I mean, what is this? I mean, I know he came in for a mission, but, I mean, he just anointed a special anointing on my middle school boy, and he left here and didn't even tell me really what, what's going on here. And so the whole family is just kind of stirred. But one thing we do know about David, he's 12, 13 years old, right? And the prophet Samuel has just anointed him. Now to David, that little middle school boy, he probably said, finally somebody listen to me, I'm great, <laughs> You know, no, he's probably thinking, wow, this is the prophet. This is pretty serious. He has anointed me. I mean, God has something special for me. Obviously, if he has come in and, and anointed me with oil. And there's one thing David knew. There was something special going on. Do you know that about 18 months to maybe two years after that is when he killed Goliath? Now, let's tie these stories together because we talked about, you know, the giant. And when he, when he went in and killed the Goliath, the, you know, what? the giant and so you're probably thinking well what where did how did David get to this point well when he was a middle school boy he got anointed then he goes out into the field as a shepherd and what does he do a bear comes he ain't afraid of no bear he ain't afraid of no lion he's tearing things up says I'm anointed by God then he goes and he faces the giant and he kills the giant so he knows that something special is going to go on in his life now over the next seven years from the age of 15 Goliath over the next seven years to about the age of 22 now David is in King Saul's good presence King Saul likes him King Saul, they're getting along, you know. And so King Saul allows David to marry one of his daughters. He allows him to become best friends with his oldest son, Jonathan, who was supposed to become the next king. But listen, then after about the age of 22, King Saul starts getting jealous of David. He's getting more and more momentum. He's getting more and more ahead of steam coming. And David's getting popular and David's getting all this stuff coming to him. And, you know, and, and he's not liking it. King Saul sees him as a threat. And so finally, at around seven years, he's 22 years old, David is. Finally, King Saul says, I got to do something about this, as we've learned in previous weeks. I got to get rid of King David, man. He's go this is not going as planned. Jonathan's supposed to be the next king. Everybody's starting to like him. He's even becoming a threat to me, and this ain't going to happen. So now he has got to get rid of David. So now David is on the run. In your outlines, David is on the run for the next eight years. Eight years. He's going to be on the run. As we've learned in previous weeks, in case you weren't here, he, he, he got upset and he, you know, he left and he made a mistake. But then he tried to go to the Philistines and say, I'll become a part of your team. And they're like, no, we're not, you're not going to be a part of us. And so then he can't go back to Israel because they're chasing him, trying to kill him. So he's kind of caught here in the wilderness. David is kind of caught between. He has nowhere to go. And he's saying, God, I've done nothing wrong. What's going on? You know, and, and he knows he's got something special for him. And so he's here in the wilderness. And God is going to show him some amazing lessons in the wilderness and I'm here to say to somebody today whether you're watching on the broadcast or whether you're sitting in this room you got to make a decision or you getting ready to make a decision and things are going on and you don't understand why maybe something's happened in your life and you're doing everything you're supposed to do and you're just trying you're being obedient and you're just going and saying God why are these things happening to me and I'm here to tell you that this some of our greatest lessons are during these times in the wilderness and we're going to see that through the life of David David's going to learn some valuable lessons that's preparing him for the future. And he's got to go through these things. And so he's sitting there going, you know, what's going on? He knows he's chosen, but he's going to learn a valuable lesson. And one of the greatest lessons he's going to learn, and it's in your outline, you can fill it in, it's not about me. David learns that. It's not about me. It's God's will, it's God's way, and it's God's timing. It's God's will, it's God's way, and it's God's timing. Somebody here today or hearing my voice say, you need to hear that. It's God's will, God's way, and God's timing. You don't move before God, and you don't move too late for God. You move right when he says to move because his way is the best. His will needs to be done, and it's on his timing and not ours. And too many times, David the first time, he took matters into his own hand, and it cost the whole priesthood at the time. Eighty-five people, were, their lives were taken because of a decision that David made to take matters into his own hands. That's to tell us that, hey, when you try to do things on your own will apart from God, we can really complicate the lives around us. 
You say, no, it's just me and God and this problem. No, it's not. There's a whole lot of people that's involved. There's a whole lot of people around you that's going to be affected because of our poor choice. And so we need to realize that. But David had learned it's not about me. It's God's will, God's way, and God's time. Let me give you two stories here about David. One of them I think you may have heard, most of you have heard. It's a very popular. One of them is not as popular. Let's, let's talk about both of them because these are stories in the Bible. And you need to read your Bible because they're in there. You're going to say, really, is that in the Bible? Yeah, it's in the Bible. You don't believe me? Go back and read it. The first story is when David is in a cave. David had some men with him, and he had some soldiers with him. They're, they're hiding up in a cave. He's always running from King Saul. He's not trying to fight King Saul. David's just trying to stay alive. He knows there's something special coming. He knows he can't go and kill King Saul, you know, and he just needs to kind of bide his time. And so he's just out there just kind of. So he knows that King Saul and his men's going to be coming by their way. And so they go up in the cave and they hide. And they think once King Saul and his men go by, they'll come down out of the cave and they'll run the other way and play this hide and seek game. You know, just kind of keep going. Just, just stay out of the way. And so he's in the cave. All the men, his men are in the cave. And all of a sudden, King Saul's men come by the front, the front of the cave. And King Saul decides he needs to relieve himself. He has to go to the bathroom. I think it's probably the only time you'll ever read in the Bible where it says he has to go to the bathroom. All right, anyway, he has to go to the bathroom. So he gets off his donkey, and he gets up, and he goes into the cave. Well, he doesn't know David and his men are in there. And so he goes up into the cave. Well, David and all his men, their eyes have adjusted, right? Because when you get in the dark for a little while, you kind of, your eyes get adjusted and you see better. Well, King Saul's just coming in. He can't really see. He's just coming in from the outside. And he just gets inside of the mouth of the cave where the men couldn't see him, you know. And he goes in there. He's going to relieve himself. And so he's in a very vulnerable position right now. I mean, he's just really, he has no idea David's in there. <laughs> and, he, and he's in there doing business. And, and, and so all the guys, I can imagine all the guys going to David going, oh, my gosh, this guy's right here. We can take him out. God has brought him right to us to kill him. And so look what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 4. The men said, and like I told the first, I believe he whispered, he didn't say it. They didn't say it. The men whispered, this is the day the Lord spoke of when, you said, when he said to you. Because David, had kept, I, I'm sure these men were like, David, how much longer have we got to do this, man? You should be the king. You've got all this influence. You got all this, you know, you, you're the one that everybody knows should be the king. How long have we got to do this? And so... David would respond and say, look, just stay with me, man. Just stick with me. I know God's got a plan. Don't give up. Hang in there. Come on now. God's got something special. And now they're saying, David, this is the time you've been talking about. And then, you know, David would always say, hey, you know, he's going to deliver the enemies right to us. And then they say, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. David, this is exactly what you've been talking about, man. This is the opportunity. Let's seize it. <laughs> he's, he, he can't protect himself. We can take him out just like that. And David, the Bible says, paraphrasing here, David walks up to him, and, and, and before he kills him, before he does it, he says, no, 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 no. I fell for this once. I'm not going to do it again. I took matters into my own hands one time. I'm not going to do it again. And he refuses to kill King Saul. King Saul finishes his business, still has no idea they're in there, walks out of the cave, down out of the cave, goes and gets on his donkey, uh, whatever he's riding, and he, he gets on there. And, and all of a sudden, David goes out to the mouth of the cave, and he hollers out, Saul! And Saul looks up and, and looks at David, and this is what that Because everybody knew then. That was the voice of David. Even Saul's people looked up and saw David, and they saw David there, and they go, David was in the cave. He could have killed our king. And all the people inside going, you ain't lying, he could have killed him. You know, and, and so everybody knew he could have, but he didn't kill the king. And look what it says in verse 12. As, Saul, as David hollers out to Saul, May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. I will not do it. I will not do it. So then let's go to another story. It's King Saul and his men. They're out in the desert, and it comes, you know, getting close to nighttime. And so, you know, again, David has his men watching Saul wherever they go. And one comes back and he reports and says, look, they're out in the desert. They're going to camp there for the night. And David says, really? Well, now you're in a, a flat land with hardly no trees. You know, you can really see. There's some hills and stuff. So David and some of his men, he's just kind of curious. He goes up to the top of the hill and he just wants to look and see where they're at. And so he goes up to the top of the hill and he's looking out there. And, and David, you know, he's just mischievous. I mean, his personality is really going to come out in these stories. And so he's just sitting there, and the sun's starting to go down, and Saul's going to do what a king does. A king at nighttime will lay down in the middle of all his men. The Bible said there was about 3,000 men, soldiers that he had. So David lays down. You put the sword in the ground right beside your head where you sleep, and you're surrounded by all of your men. 
And so David's looking out over the camp. You know, he's looking at far, and he's looking at the camp. And he's saying, Abishai, and he's a, one of his men. Abishai, I got a really bad idea. Do you want to be a part of my really bad idea? <laughs> and Abishai says, sure, I'll do it. And so the really bad idea is, is he's going to go down to where King Saul is. Look what it says in 1 Samuel 26 and verse 7. 1 Samuel 26 and verse 7. So David and Abishai went to the army by night. In other words, they'd all laid down and they'd gone to sleep. And there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner, he's the chief bodyguard. He's the one that's going to protect the king, right? Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. And then in verse 8, Abishai said to David, now they've gone past the guards. Nobody has noticed them. I don't know how, I don't, this is in the Bible, all right? And he goes, gets by everybody, and he's in there. And then in verse 8, Abishai told David, again, he didn't tell him, he whispered, right? He just, shh. Anyway, today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now, can you imagine Abishai? He was in the cave. Can you imagine? Look, David, man. <laughs> look, there's, the king is right here. Nobody's even spotted us. Now, look, look, look. Look, this is the time. Don't miss this opportunity. This is our second. You missed the first one. Let's don't miss this opportunity. He's right here. It's time to take power. It's time to take matters into your own hands. It's time to give you what God has told you you're going to have. It's time to take. Let's do this right now. Let's don't miss it. Then Abishai sees David not moving. And he goes, all right, all right, all right, David. I know you're this religious guy. And I know you're not supposed, you know, you're not supposed to, to touch or mess with the anointed man. But guess what? God hasn't told me I can't, all right? <laughs> he hasn't told me. I know you can't. You know, you got all these religious rules that you got to follow. But I'm telling you, I can take him out. I can take him out. He says this. He says, now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear, and I won't strike him twice. In other words, I'll just do it once. I'll kill him. I'll, I'll take him out. I mean, when I do this, David, guess what, David? When I stab him, his eyes are going to go wide open, and the last person he's going to see is your face. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, we're going to take him out right here. I will do this for you, David. We'll do it right now. And you can be king like you deserve to be. Now, I'm skipping a bunch of stuff here. but Verse 9, but David said to Abishai, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? So here David has another opportunity. David's been sneaky. He and Abishai went down there to it. He says, look. We can't, I can't do this. This is not about me. And God has not told me to kill him. He is anointed right now. He is an anointed one, and I'm not going to go and kill him. It's not going to be on my hands. I've done that route one time. I've messed up, and I'm not going to go there again. And David says, however, let's have a little fun. <laughs> you want to have a little fun, Abishai? All right. So what does he tell Abishai? You get his sword. I'll get his water jug, all right? And then we'll sneak out of here. And so they do. They take the sword, they take the water and jug, and they sneak back out, and no one ever knows. It's in the Bible. Read it, all right? It's in there. I'm not making this up. And so they do that, and they go out, and then they wait until the sun comes up. And David's up on the mountain. He's just ready to mess with him. You know, he's not going to kill him, but he wants to make a little fun. Have a little fun. You know, like, he's mischievous. It's his personality. He's kind of got this going on like some of us have. And so he's up there, and the sun starts to come up, and and all of a sudden, he hollers out, Abner! Remember Abner? He's the bodyguard for King Saul. He was the one supposed to protect him. Abner! You missing anything, buddy? <laughs> hey, you missing anything? And everybody recognized David's voice. They recognized him. And, and they, they're like, look, oh, missing anything? And so they look over at the king. And his sword and his water and jug is gone. It's not there. And David's holding them up. He says, Abner, you're a poor excuse for a bodyguard. <laughs> You should be ashamed of yourself. Actually, you should be put to death. Man, I could have killed the king. You know, it's like, that's, you, just, you just missed it. All right, we're going to skip on down even further than that. So he's messed with him. He had two opportunities to kill him. Everybody knew on both sides he could have killed him twice now, and he didn't do it because it wasn't God's will, it wasn't God's way, and it wasn't God's timing. So now he's going to do things the right way because he's already messed up once, and he's not going to learn the hard way again. Now, skipping on down through, eventually King Saul and Jonathan, Jonathan is King Saul's oldest son, he was David's friend, and he was also the next in line to be king. According to Saul, that's what he wanted to happen. And so they get killed in a battle with the Philistines. And so once they get killed, then uh, 
somebody come up to him and he said, you know, actually, it was interesting because David was sad. I mean, this guy had caused him a lot of grief. Now, he liked Jonathan, but he, was, he mourned because these two were killed in the battle. The Bible talks about that. And it says, you know, that he really mourned. Instead of having a party, he was sad. Now, there's 12 tribes of Israel. 12 different tribes. The tribe that David was from is called Judah. And so the, the tribe of Judah, once these two, once the king was gone and the next in line was gone there, you know, they said, David, you're going to be our king now. David, you're going to be our king. You're the next, you know, you're the one that we know has the influence with another one God wants you to be, and we're going to do it. But the eleven tribes other than Judah, one of King Saul's sons, one of King Saul's sons decides, hey, his name is Ishbosheth. He decides, I'm going to take the other 11 tribes, and I'm going to be the king over them. Hey, it's, it's keeping the family. I'm going to be over them. And so for seven more years, there's conflict between the family of David and the family of King Saul. And David's not wanting to do battle. He's not trying to force himself over the other 11. He's just trying to avoid and keep the peace, and he's going to be the king over Judah, and he's doing his thing. He's avoiding the conflict. And the people are like, David, go claim what's yours. It's yours, dude. You've been anointed to be that king, and you, you, know, you know that. You've got influence. You've got the power. Go and go ahead and do it. Seven years go by, and then two brothers come together, and they go, all right. And they snuck into Ishbosheth's house at night while he was asleep, and they went in, and they killed him. And they're thinking, if we can get him out of the way, then our David can be the king over all 12 tribes, like it's supposed to be. And then we'll get a big reward because this guy is an obstacle in the way of King David. And so they went in there and they killed him. And you know what they did? They chopped his head off. And they're going to take it to David. They beheaded him. Watch what it says, 2 Samuel 4 and verse 8. They brought the head of Ishbosheth to David of Hebron and said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, your enemy, who tried to kill you. <laughs> Here it is. And they're thinking they're going to get a reward and it's going to be great. Let me give you some information on beheadings because maybe you're sitting there thinking, that's really gory. Why would you do that? I mean, that's just, I mean, if you do it today in today's society, it'd be sick, right? I mean, it's just really bad. Well, it is sick anyway. But, um, but during that time, why would they do beheadings? Because they didn't have iPhones, right? <laughs> they didn't have cameras. You go back and tell King David, hey, yeah, we, we killed him. He's dead. He's on the other side of that mountain over there. And David's like, yeah, right. Yeah. No, you take his head. It's a lot easier than taking his whole body, right? <laughs> No, you just take his head and you say, look, there it is. He's dead, you know. And so they do that and they take the head to him, put it in a bag, and they're expecting a reward. They're thinking, all right, this is going to be awesome. But look how David responds. Look at this now. David loves the Lord. David wants to do God's will, God's way. He wants to follow the right timing of God. And David answered Rahab and his brother Benay, As surely as the Lord lives, who has delivered, who has delivered me out of every trouble? As surely as the Lord lives, who has, li listen guys, who has delivered me out of every trouble? Guys, as sure as the Lord lives, are you listening? Who has delivered me? He didn't need your help. He didn't need you to do this. You know, and you're sitting here thinking, hey, all this is great. Look at verse 10. When someone, this is what David says, when someone told me that Saul is dead and thought it was bringing the good news, I seized him and I put him to death. This was the reward I gave to him for his news. Now these two guys are not so happy. <laughs> in other words, in verse 11, How much more then, David says, when wicked men have killed an innocent man in his ho own house in his own bed? How wicked is that? Maybe they would say, what well, Ishbosheth was not innocent. He was trying to kill you. But David says, it's God's will, and it's God's way, and it's God's time. We don't take matters into our own hands. We can't we control all the variables around us. We don't know what all God's up to. And we're not going to take matters into our own hands and mess up what he's wanting to try to do. In verse 12, so David gave an order to his men, and they killed them. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it, which was a sign of honor. And they buried it in Abner's tomb in Hebron. And after Ishbosheth was dead, the 11, other 11 tribes came to David, and they said, you're the king. And so now David is going to be the king over all 12 tribes, and it all comes together. Let's look what the text says, though, for seven more years. Seven more years here. But let's look at what's going to happen next. 
2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 1, all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, we are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. In other words, David, we knew who had the influence all along. We knew who had the power. We knew who, who had the, really had the authority. And then the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel and you will become their ruler. And there was no mystery. Everybody knew this was coming. David was destined. But then look at verse 3. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, in other words, in this moment, he's going to show his true greatness. In this moment, he's going to apply what he learned while he was in the desert. In this moment, he's going to do, show some extraordinary maturity because the difficult lessons that were done when he was running and hiding, he's going to apply them, and it's going to show greatness. And again, during your life, and your, what, what happens during the difficult times in your life and how you and I handle these situations is going to show how we mature. And it's also going to show how that we're going to be prepared for what he has for us in the future. Now, David's already got the power. He's not been given the crown yet, but he's already got the power. He's already got the authority. And then look what he does here at the end of the verse. The king made a covenant with them at Hebron. Now, wait a minute. Let me just explain this. A covenant is an agreement. He's making some promises to the people. Now, think about it. He's already going to be king. He doesn't have to get any more votes. He doesn't have to do this. But now it's like, I'm going to make some promises to you guys. These guys are going, what? You know, it's like, you're already going to be king. Why you got to make all these, like a politician, you know, make promises to all these things that he's going to do and all these things, that's what they do. He doesn't, it's not necessary. He doesn't have to do these things, but he does. Look what it says. When all the elders of Israel, in verse 3, had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And before the Lord is huge because now he's getting ready to go public how he's going to be king. He's going to show everybody how I'm going to be the king. And this is what he's going to say. He's going to say, look, I have not lost who I am. I am a king, but he is the king. I'm going to be a king as a leader, but he's still going to guide us. He's going to give us the authority. I'm not, it's not about me. He's going to guide me to lead you. And that's the way that he's going to do it. And so David had waited 15 years on God. David had gone through a lot of stuff, but he was patient. And now these important lessons he's learned are going to come to play. It's not about me. But one of the important things that he learned was leadership is always a stewardship. It's a stewardship. It's taking care of something. It's not for personal gain. It's not to get what you can get out of it. Yeah, I, I've got this title. I've got this position. Now I can do what I want, and everybody's going to do what I want, and it's all about me. No. As a servant leader like Jesus, as a servant leader, we're to do it for the benefit of everybody else. And kings are held accountable. Now, while this is inspiring, this whole story, you might say, well, that's just cool. You know, that's just, no. It's, it needs to be more than inspiring to our lives. This is, as a Christ follower, this is required. The way that David is leading is not about me. I may be in this position of leading these people, but he's still the king. He's still where the authority comes from. He's still the power, and he's the one that's going to give me influence to give you what you need. And so, Let's just fast forward just a little bit as we're wrapping this up. A thousand years later, Jesus is going to give us another example of this. Now, this is just this, this is so crazy. 20 miles north of where this just took place with David. 20 miles north, a thousand years later, David's going to give us a different twist. He's going to do the same thing David did, except it's going to be a different twist. And he's going to show us this. He's going to model the same thing, which just affirms here how we are supposed to handle the influence and the authority and the power that we have. Look at this. Now, John's going to write in John 13, John 13, now he was an eyewitness to Jesus. He was right there with him. He was in the room with him. He had learned from Jesus. He had saw the miracles. You know, and look at verse, what he writes in verse 1 of chapter 13. John says, it was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. In other words, he says it was just, over the, just before the Passover, and Jesus knew, he knew, it was time for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Now, Jesus knows he's getting ready to be crucified. He's getting ready to be arrested. He's getting ready to be taken in. He knows all this stuff is coming. He's been chased by all the people of Judea and Galilee. The very ones that should have seen him as the Messiah, they just knew the Messiah was coming. They're going to be the ones that crucify him and kill him. Look at verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Jesus had the power already, 
without the crown. He had the authority, but he didn't have the title. But look what he's getting ready to do. He's, look what Jesus, he hasn't gone to the cross. He hasn't died yet and been risen from the dead. He's not the king of kings and lord of lords yet. They're still going to crucify him. They're not seeing him as the king. He's got the authority and he's got the power. But watch how he handles this. And this is a very familiar story. Look what he does. So John, in verse 4, so he got up. In other words, he was at the meal. He got up. So he got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing and he wrapped a towel around his waist. So here he is with the men in the upper room. They're sitting there having a meal. And, and he's sitting after the meal. Now he's going to get up from that table and he's going to go and he takes off some of his clothing and he puts something around his waist. And, and everybody in the room, I'm sure there was silence. They knew what he was getting ready to do. And they were like, no way. He's the king. He's got the power. He's got the influence. No. And as he starts to do this, I'm sure Peter, well, Peter's like, hey, no, Lord, you can't do this. You can't wash our feet. He's getting ready, he's getting ready to wash our feet. No, th- we have servants that do this. We have slaves that do this. You're not required to do this, Lord. No. No, we've seen what you can do with your hands. You're not going to take your hands and wash our feet. We've seen you do miracles with that. No, we're not going to allow you to just sit back down. And you've, you've been our teacher. You know, we've been following you. No, you're not going to do this. And I'm sure Jesus just smiled. And he looked around the room. And after he finished, he, he got up. And in verse 5, after that, he poured the water into the basin. After that, Peter had said this. And he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. And then he put on his robe which showed pretty much that he was a rabbi, that he had the authority, the power, and the influence over them. He was their teacher. He was the leader in the room. He was the one everybody was looking at. But he's teaching them a lesson. He teaches us a lesson just like David does. So he sat down, I'm sure, and he grinned. And I think there's probably silence in the room. And they're, all, they're all looking around. And nothing really needs to be said because what he did just then preached the greatest message to these guys that they'll probably ever hear is how that he knelt down and he served them and he washed their feet. But Jesus does say something. He didn't have to, but he does. Look down in verse 14 as we're wrapping this up, 14 and 15. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Verse 15. I have set for you an example that you should do as I have done for you. You know, whenever we think we are something or somebody or you know, that we've arrived or we've got this position or we've been given the keys or whatever it is that we, all of a sudden this, this incident has happened and, I, and now I've got this kind of influence. How we handle that is huge. I've seen too many Christians in their Christian walk take advantage of that. And that's the opposite of what David did. And that's the opposite of what our Lord did. Whenever we have influence, it's an opportunity for us to invest in those people around us. It's an opportunity for us to 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 do things for the benefit of those around us, not to gain for ourselves. So whenever we're in those situations, when we arrive and think that we are somebody, and you don't know how you will act when you get there. You might say, I would do this, but when you get there, and all of a sudden all eyes are looking at you, sometimes you'll get puffed up. Sometimes you'll really think that you are somebody. Sometimes, you know, you, all this. And, and, and you and I need to realize, whenever that happens, we need to look around and look for more feet to wash. Look for more feet to wash. Look for more feet to wash. Because perhaps the greatest indicator of our maturity is how we handle authority, how we handle power, and how we handle influence. Some of you have already been given some influence. Maybe it's on a big realm. I've seen some of you that are that are in one of these two services today that you handle your influence. And you're doing exactly like David and Jesus. You're taking your influence and you're using it to benefit those around you, but for yourself. You're using it in the right way. Same thing. You may just be a a teacher in a classroom. You may just be a person down at the job site with a a bunch of guys or a bunch of girls, and you're you're just in a situation where you're just around some people. Maybe it's just in your home, and you've been given some influence, and you've been given some authority, and maybe you've been given some power, and they're looking at you for decisions. They're looking for you for clarity, and they're looking at it, and you would never take advantage of that situation to benefit yourself you would rather not receive stuff for yourself to benefit those that are in your relationships or in your room and that's the way you should do it but i've seen too many people abuse that authority for the benefit of yourself we don't be like that david taught us hey look it's not about me it's not about me 
It's not about me at all. It's God's will, it's God's way, and it's God's time. And then Jesus goes and he shows an example by washing the feet. At that time, that was the lowest of lowest of jobs to have to do. And if he's the leader, why would he be doing that? But he's showing us there should be nothing beneath us. We never arrive and get good enough to get above anything. That starts with the pastor of the church. For us, there's nothing that I, I shouldn't be, should be beneath me when God tells me to do something. In the same way with you. I hear Christians, well, I'll do this, but I ain't doing that. I ain't doing that. I'm thinking if the Lord tells you to, why would you not? And if, if, if there's ten people in a room and something needs to be done, you look around, well, they need to do it, you know. No. If you've got some influence, too, you know, why not? You set the example by leading like, like David did and like Jesus did, you know, and said, hey, let's, you know, let's love one another and serve one another. And it's not about me. It's God's will, God's way, and God's time, and, and that's the most important thing. And this, is, and this church right here is God's. You know, I'll, I'll say the same thing that David says. I might be the pastor, but he is the, <laughs> he's the king of kings and lord of lords. He's the one that's going to call the shots. And we all need to be that way. No matter how big of a spectrum or how small of a spectrum you have, how we handle our influence really shows our maturity. That's our measuring stick. And so look at Mark 10 and verse 45 as the band comes. We'll, we'll wrap it up with this verse right here. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many when we first started this church we started out with a book lead like jesus and it was on servant leadership it was about serving and loving one another's and it's not about me and that is so important as christ follows how we handle what influence we have in our life how we handle that really shows the maturity of where we are in our walk with christ imagine if all of us lived that way like david and jesus it's not about me Lord, I'll go through these hard times and learn some hard lessons. I'll go through all this, God, because it's not about me. It's about you and what you want to do in my life. And I believe every one of you here in this room, so to speak, has been anointed if you're a Christ follower. God's got a calling on your life and a plan of something he's wanting you to do. Let me just say this as your pastor, looking at David. You may have to go through some hard situations that you don't understand. But I always say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to show me? And I'll endure all this to get to whatever it is you want me to do. Because it's not about me. It's about those people that are in my family. It's about those people that are in my workspace. It's about those people, God, that I've got influence over in my life. I want it to be for the benefit of them. And that's the way that we should live like David and Jesus. Let's bow your head this morning. Father, I pray right now your Holy Spirit continue to do a work in us. Lord, I, I don't know where this is landing with everybody in this room. I don't know, Lord, you know how this is going to affect people that are going through a rough time and decisions that they're making. And I pray, Lord, most of all, that they don't move before you, but yet they don't wait too late after you've told them to move. Lord, I pray your way, your will, and your time will be done, even though we don't understand some of the things that's going on in this life. But Lord, do show us. Do show us, teach us these lessons like David learned. Pray we don't have to make this, these mistakes of taking matters into our own hands. We can learn from the Bible and learn from David. He did it once and he refused to do it again. And he finally reached to where he was supposed to be. Lord, speak into our lives right now. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one's looking around. You know, now's the time that we just do business with the Lord. Now's the time we've come in and we've heard. Are you getting ready to make a decision that you know is not God's will, God's way, and God's timing? My, my prayer for you is you don't do it. But it just makes sense. It just makes sense that that's, you know, if you're not 100% sure that's what God wants you to do, you don't do it. You just say, Lord, what are you trying to show me? What do you, what do you want me to do about this? I'm going to do it your way because it's your way, your will, and your time. So it's time to do business with the Lord. What is it that you're going to do? As your heads are bowed and eyes are closed and no one's looking around, I will say this. And you'll be hearing more from this from me in the future. But this down here is an altar. And corporately when we come together and we're doing business with the Lord, I want you to feel free to come forward. And if you can't bow down, you can just stand. If you want to kneel down, you can. 
and just pray. It doesn't mean anything's wrong in your life. It could be that you're praying for someone else. It could be that you and your spouse come down, you're praying for a situation for someone else that you know about. It doesn't have to be that something's wrong in your life. But I want this to be, there's something, there's power in corporately praying together. And you have the right to come down and pray together. You may come down for two minutes and get up while they're singing and, and go back to your seat. That's okay. You don't have to wait till the song's over. You come down and do business. But it also gives an opportunity because there are some times when you're going through situations that some people know about and they can come down and corporately lay their hands. And we had it happen in the first service. They corporately lay their hands on you and just pray over you. There is power in praying together. There is power in coming forward. And, and I want to encourage you and have the freedom to be able to do that, to come forward and do that. So as you're doing business with the Lord and before they sing this last song, I want to ask you one more question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because as we've talked about today, you know, there are things in this world that we just can't control and there's certain things we can't handle. There is a higher power and it's Jesus Christ who gave his life for you so that your sins could be forgiven. And, and it's not about you getting your life together and, you know, once you get everything together and you come in, then you can do it. No, you need to get Jesus in your life and let him show you and direct you in the path that you should go and help you through all the mess that you may be in. I don't, I don't know your situation. Maybe you're just here and you've been coming for a while and you say, you know what, I'm ready to receive Christ. The Holy Spirit's drawing me. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today can be the day of salvation for you. I believe with all my heart every word of the Bible is true. And I believe that he died on the cross so your sins could be forgiven and my sins could be forgiven. If you've never done that, you say, what must I do? The Bible says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You've got to believe that he did go to the cross and he died on the cross. Why? Because he was the only one that could. Because he was sinless. He had no sin. He shed his blood. He gave his body. And God raised him from the dead three days after they, he had died on the cross. And now he's a risen Savior. And your sins could be forgiven because of what he did. Not anything you can do. There's nothing you and I can do but receive him into our life. You say, Pastor Carl, that's me. I need Jesus in my life. I can't do this on my own. Maybe you're watching the broadcast. You're sitting there. Today is the day of salvation. If, if you will call out to him, he will forgive you of your sin. He will do it. You say, that's me. I'm going to pray. You just pray with me, but you're praying to a holy God. Dear Jesus, I need you. I need you in my life. I can't do this on my own anymore. I believe you died for me so that my sins could be forgiven. And right now I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I place my faith in you. I choose to follow you. I am yours. I'm yours. If you're here this morning and you, you said, Pastor, that's me. That's me. I just received Christ as my Lord and Savior. I rejoice with you. This congregation rejoices with you. You've just made a great decision. And I don't want to embarrass you, and I don't want to call you out or anything like that, but could, would you be willing to let me know that you received Christ as your Lord and Savior? Nobody's looking around. You say, Pastor Carl, that was me. I needed Jesus, and I called out to him and asked him to forgive me of my sins. That was me. I want you to slip your hand up right now. Don't even hesitate. Thank you for that one to my right. Somebody else, you say, I was ready, and I called out to Jesus, and I received him as my Lord and Savior. You have made a great decision. Today is the day of salvation for you. You were serious. He knew it, and you're his. Now let him have all of you. Just follow him. Anybody else? Anybody else? Whether you raised your hand or not, if you would just take your communication card inside your worship guide, fill it out. On the back it says, I accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Just check that little box, and when you're on the way out, just drop your card in the box in the lobby with everybody else they're putting prayer requests and all kind of stuff in there just drop your card and i'd love to get in touch with you and and help you any way i can i won't harass you but you know if there's some literature i can get you or point you in a, a direction i'd love to help you whether you raise your hand or not we are happy for you father i thank you so much lord for your word now we've heard it now let us apply it lord uh, in our lives let us be like david and be like christ in a way that it's not about us it's all about you your way, your will, your timing. Thank you so much for all you do. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.